Welcome. Hello, my name is Beth Wyman, Commodore of the Inland Lake Yachting Association. Within the organization, we have amazing and talented sailors who have demonstrated a tremendous amount of tactical and boat handling skills on the race course. One of the strategic goals of the ILYA is to maximize sailors' performance through education. With that in mind, the ILYA Promotions Committee is creating and distributing a series of educational seminars to be shown as live webinars over the next seven to 10 weeks. The series will tap into our own ILYA sailors and disseminate information to sailors of all ages and levels. We believe the information gained will be applicable and relevant for many years to come. We'd like to thank the ILYA Foundation and their education grant and Salesing for making this project possible. Many of you remember Salesing for their leadership role in the 2018 hashtag Fair Sailing Initiative. The company was founded by ILYA members Al Hager and Rob Hudson. They provide free sailing tips and techniques to sail faster and smarter. On their website, salesing.com, you'll find diagrams, videos presented from an ILYA sailor perspective. Check it out. I'm sure you'll find salesing.com the quickest and easiest path for racing sailors to improve their knowledge and skills. And so, now on with the show. Tonight's guests and experts are from Robel Shea Sailing. We have Stephanie Robel, wave Stephanie. Born in East Troy, Wisconsin, and sailed on Lake Beulah her whole life. She sailed in college for Old Dominion University, earning two All-American honors. Maggie Shea grew up in Wilmette, Illinois, and she sailed, learned to sail with her family on her grandpa's boat on Lake Michigan and on butterflies in White Lake, Michigan with her cousins. She sailed for Connecticut College, where she was an honorable mention All-American. Interestingly enough, both ladies look up to Sally Barco as a role model in their sport. Steph and Maggie first sailed together in a 29er in 2005. They raced against each other in high school, and then they teamed up for some summer 29er and 420 sailing. Right after college, Steph and Maggie raced professionally in the Women's International Match Racing Series, which they won in 2014. They teamed up again, 49ers, in fall of 2016. And over the course of their campaign in the 49er FX together, they brought home a bronze World Cup medal, a silver Pan Am Games medal, and a bronze World Championship medal. They recently climbed to world ranking of number four, and as we all heard, qualified to compete in the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. We can't wait to cheer them on, and we can't wait to hear what they have to say to us this evening. All right, thank you very much, Beth, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm Steph Robel. I'm joining you all from Miami, Florida. Um, I'm really excited to connect with you all today um, for our first webinar. Um, a huge, huge, huge thank you to the ILYA and Sales Zing for organizing this opportunity and to all of you for joining us tonight. We are just so proud to represent the ILYA um, as we train and compete around the world. Um, it's just an absolute honor to represent the Inland Lakes Yachting Association. Um, and we're really proud to have won the Olympic trials in February and are really grateful for all of your support. Um, it's, it's an honor to follow in the footsteps of fellow ILYA Olympians, uh, Buddy Melgus, Bill Allen, Bill Benson, John Ruff, Sally Barco, and Annie Hager. Um, so right now, as you all can probably guess, we aren't training and therefore missing sailing a lot. Um, and I know you guys are all just starting to ramp things up um, up north for the sailing season. And we really hope that it can go mostly according to plan. Um, and hopefully this chat will just be a, a nice refresher for all of you. And, that, and we hope that you learn something to bring forward into your summer of racing. Um, so just a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be tackling the next couple of weeks. Um, today we'll be mainly focused on racing strategy and racing approach. Um, then we'll get into starting and some tactical boat on boat situations, um, then downwind sailing, um, some boat speed and rigging tips from Maggie and some rules for, to finish it off. 
All right, so we're gonna kick things off with just kind of talking about our approach. Um, Maggie and I have been sailing full time together for four years now, and we've had a lot of time to experiment with and learn about our approach to racing. Um, everyone's style is different when it comes to competing, so it's really important that the team is on the same page. Um, first of all, we like to keep things really simple. I'm sure you guys have all heard the, the KISS attitude, keep it simple, stupid. Um, you know, we, we really aim to leave no stone unturned in our campaign, um, but we feel that when it comes to racing, it's really important to execute simple things really well um, at a high percentage of the time. Um, and then our, our approach is very process oriented, which means we break things down step by step. Um, the mentality is, what do I need to focus on now and what do I need to do immediately next? It allows your mind to only focus on the now um, and really just not give any, any mental energy to anything else that could be going on around you. Um, you have to find your process that works for you and then trust it and don't deviate from it. Um, next, um, aim to keep things unemotional and keep the emotions out of, mainly keep the emotions out of decision making. Um, we, we aim to objectively assess what's going on um, and this is something that we worked really hard on um, before our 2019 World Championship in New Zealand with um, John Bertrand. Um, he really talked a lot about what wise-minded decisions versus emotional-minded decisions. Um, it's really hard to have consistent results when you're kind of riding an emotional roller coaster. So John kind of came up with this term of tactical intelligence, and it's a process that we adopted um, from him that we'll touch that we'll touch base on. Excuse me. Touch base on later. Um, next, it's to trust your gut. Um, I think this is a really important thing for lake racing. Um, and obviously, the more experience you have, the easier it is to trust your gut. But um, you know, sometimes you just don't have an explanation for what's going on or time to think through the scenario. So there's a lot of times when I'll say, oh, "Maggie, I just I don't know what to do here," and she'll say, "I I trust your gut. Let's go with your gut." Um, so that's a really important factor. And then also um, trusting your teammate as well. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, in the 49er, I steer the boat, but Maggie trims the main sheet. So there's some really important communication that has to happen between the two of us. And obviously a lot of trust that we each feel the boat in the same way. So, um, you know, really trusting that Maggie's doing her job to the best of her abilities and um, not micromanaging at all. There was a Pretty funny moment in Japan last summer while we were training. Um, we were doing some lineups with the British girls and we were not going very well. And Dave Ullman was there with us and he was he was saying, okay, let's let's try this, let's try this. We have them you know, looking at our sails and then ultimately he was like, what are you guys talking about on board? And we decided that basically I was telling Maggie how to turn the main sheet and she was telling me how to drive and just doing a lot of micromanaging. Um, yeah, moral of the story is to really trust your teammate on how how they're doing their things. Um, focus on the now, um, that kind of goes back to the process oriented mindset, um, but really trying to be present and give your best. Um, if you let your mind wander to worrying about what your competitors are doing or what place you're in, it takes energy away from sailing your own boat. So if you find your mind, go into somewhere else, breathe, reset, and focus on what you can do now to protect your game, protect your game or gain in your game. Um, and last but not least, and most important, um, is to have fun. Um, race, we really race our best when we're out there just in, enjoying every step of the process. Um, there's a lot of days when Maggie will be cracking funny jokes on the way out to the race course, and that's when I'm like, we're going to have a good day. It's, it's all about having fun. Yeah, now that, so Steph did a great job summarizing a lot of our sort of mantras and our approach to racing and, and now I just want to tell you real quick here's how you win all of the races okay you start in first place you sail faster than everyone else you pass all of the boats and you sail in more wind and shorter distance you do fewer and better maneuvers you've got the best lanes on the course and then you win okay we're done right Steph that's good cool. okay, okay. Um, I'm kidding so this would obviously this is a recipe to win a race but not a single person in the world can execute this hundred percent of the time right that's impossible so we aim to have a game plan that's got a higher rate of execution. You just have to be right more of the time than your competitors, right? You make a million decisions over the course of a, of a race, you know, you, and if you could just make those decisions a little bit better and make a few more better decisions than the next person, 
you're going to beat them and you have to make, so it's, it's all about making better decisions and really continuing to learn throughout the day because no one gets out to a race course and knows exactly what's going to happen. It's impossible pred to predict, you know, and every race course is different. That's what's so unique about our sport. And we're so lucky that every day is different. Every race is different. Even if you're in the same place in the same direction, you usually get, you know, a totally different day. And so um, you just have to be adaptable. You've got to learn more and you've got to learn as you go on, you know? So, so obviously there's a recipe to winning a race, but uh, what you can execute, that's not always in your control. What's in your control, what you can execute is just your decision-making process. And so that's what Steph and I really want to talk about today. Um, but before we get into that, just to break it down, this is kind of how we talk about what we're focusing on, because like I said, there are a million different things you could focus on throughout the course of the day. So many decisions you're going to have to make. The more we can boil it down, the better. So this is really simple. We, we learned this from an Australian coach named Dane Sharp. Three variables, cow, right? There's the course which is your course-based decisions, like, am I going to hit shore before I get to that ley line? Is one tack a lot longer than the other? I'll show you a couple diagrams in a second, but those are all course-based decisions based on basically where are the buoys, where am I trying to sail to? Then we have um, opponent or fleet-based decisions. That gets into, we like to call those opponent-based decisions tactics. So the boat on boat stuff is tactics, and then the rest of it is basically strategy. And the last one is wind. So the majority of your strategic decisions are really based on what is the wind going to do? What has it been doing? What do we think it's going to do? That's what we really want to get into today. But um, before we do that, I just want to breeze through the course-based decisions because they're pretty straightforward. Um, you know, if you ask yourself, is the course really skewed because there's been a big wind shift? I know you guys sail often on relatively small lakes that are near shore. Those tend to be really shifty. So the breeze is going back and forth. Maybe multiple fleets are racing. The race committee doesn't have the mark in the exact right spot, which I know never happens on Lake Beulah, especially if the porters are doing race committee, right? Never, never. It's always perfectly square. So on any of the other lakes, if you're on any, anywhere else, so if, if there's ever an issue, um, you know, or the wind shifts, this course becomes skewed and you'll spend more time on one board than the other. Um, or maybe you're at ley line. That's a completely course-based decision. That's an easy one. You know, maybe you start and you're already very close to ley line. You're attacked right away. Um, here are a couple diagrams of what happens to the geometry of the race course. So this one in the middle is a square course. In a perfect world, if you start on starboard, tack only once, you'll spend about 50% on starboard, 50% on port, and you'll be at the winner mark. But if there's been a left shift, you're going to spend a longer percentage of time on port. Um, again, if you start on starboard and only tack once, and then same on the right shift. The opposite happens. If you start on starboard, you'll spend a longer percentage of time on starboard. So if you're not really sure what's happened, um, the amount of time you've traveled, maybe you're doing some pre-race homework, sailing up the race course, the amount of time you travel on each board can, in, can tell you, okay, I know the race course is either square or skewed. Um, but those are the course-based ones. Now I'm gonna let Steph talk a little bit about the strategy, how we conceptualize strategy. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we adopted this um, tactical intelligence from John Bertrand and. It's using what we know about the course to objectively assess what is happening and, and have a constant conversation on board. Um, for example, if we say before the start that we really like the left um, and then we start near the pin and we're, you know, we're heading out, just ripping out to the left-hand side and we look over our shoulder and almost the whole fleet is starting to tack off and go more towards the right-hand side, we have to make a decision if we want to go with the majority of the fleet or if we want to keep going with what we believe in in the left. Um, emotionally sailing, you could say, I'm going left no matter what, but wise-minded sailing, you might say, okay, we're in a good spot here. We just had a good start. Let's keep an eye on the boats who are going right. If we get headed, then we'll tack. Um, and then Maggie will dive into compass numbers and keeping track of those for me so that that decision becomes really easy for me. Um, and then, next slide, Mags. Sorry. Oh. Um, just some cool questions that go along with this. Um, again, we really aim to keep things super simple. Um, and these are some questions that we've brought forward into our racing um, to help us break it all down. So first, what place are we in? Um, and does this placement in the fleet put me in an offensive, defensive, or total turnaround mentality? Um, let's say we round the first win remark in 15th. And we say we need to gain five more boats in order to have a top 10 keeper race. Well, that puts us in offense mode. 
Next, we ask how much risk do we want to take? Um, risk levels are we can risk, we don't risk, or we must risk. Um, so if we're in 12th and we want to be top nine, we are in a can risk scenario. If we're in 25th and we've already sailed our drop race in, um, in the regatta, then we are on a must risk course and need to have a total turnaround race. Um, and then obviously if we're top three and sailing a keeper race, then we're in defense mode and we don't risk at all. Um, next, um, John likes to call this math or adding it all up. The obvious things, are we lifted and clear air, max pressure and going fast? Um, this is just a, a constant checklist that we can have going to understand if we're in a good position or what we need to do in order to achieve um, our offensive or defensive game plan. And then um, sailing the course or sailing the wind, um, we kind of talked about that earlier and we'll get some more into that in a little bit, but um, those are to sailing the course and wind or sailing the fleet is a really important part. And if you're generally speaking, if you're in an offensive mode, you're sailing the course and the wind. And then if you're in defensive mode, um, you're sailing the fleet, just trying to keep yourself between um, the fleet and the mark. And then next, um, having a constant dialogue of compass information, speed feedback, and discussing the next steps. Um, and having this narrative go on no matter where we are in the fleet, um, you know, what kind of day we've had already. But it just, it helps us keep focused on that process that we talked about. Um, and it really helps everyone understand on board what the current situation is and what the priorities are. So, um, you know, you can really develop your game plan by understanding all the different variables for the course um, and then use this tactical intelligence to assess what's going on in your race. And one part of the tactical intelligence that I really, that I think helped us a lot is it's just, keeping an ongoing dialogue and an ongoing narrative of what you think is going to happen then what does happen and then you check in on it did that happen you know and um that allows you to keep learning throughout the day if you think it's going to go left you send it to the left side that didn't happen but you don't make that next step of acknowledging and recognizing that my hypothesis was wrong you know or i was right we're going to go do that again um, you don't get as much information from the day and you can't make as, you know, you can't make great, better decisions as the day goes on. So it, um, it definitely helps us increase our knowledge as the day goes on about the race course that we're sailing on. All right. So speaking of race courses, um, we're really lucky to sail 200 days a year um, in a lot of different venues around the world. And it's really important that when we get out in the race course in each of these venues that we understand the ins and outs of all of them um, and how each different type of venue affects our sailing style. So um, just a couple of examples. Um, the top left was racing in Genoa, Italy last year um, with a shoreline on the right and then open water, a big open body of water on the left hand side. Um, so there was more wind closer to land. Um, for whatever reason, it was just always more wind. So we were racing to the right most of the regatta. Um, top right, we were sailing in um, Sydney Harbor where it was really offshore, puffy and shifty conditions. Um, super similar to lake sailing, um, really fun, my favorite type of sailing. Um, bottom left, uh, this was sailing in Palma de Mallorca last spring. Um, as you can see, there's a shoreline on the left-hand side um, of the race course and then the right-hand side is pretty open water. Um, and a, in a southerly breeze, um, the left-hand side of the race course pays every single time. Um, and then on the bottom right, this is us sailing in Japan, where we had uh, a sea breeze day. Comes from the south, super open race course, oscillating shifts, um, and as you can see, a pretty decent sea state. So, you know, every day and every race, it's really important that we're able to quickly and accurately assess what's happening on the race course. So, Steph just described, gave you a specific beautiful photos of all these different race courses that we've been on but it's like almost impossible to keep that straight and then know how to apply that to the next day we do keep a lot of playbooks you know so we'll take notes on what type of trends we saw what breeze directions were and, and so on and so forth but you can't always have those notebooks out on the race course with you and it's not always the same so how do you take all of those observations you have when you get out, when you first get out to the race course and formulate a game plan from it um and I also want to admit that there are a lot of days that, yeah, we sail on the same race course, but the same thing doesn't happen over and over, you know, unless it's a specific geographical trend. 
And so here's the system we use. We basically take all of our observations, we, you know, on the way to the race course, we'll just throw adjectives out. You know, we'll just go back and forth. Okay, what kind of data is, is it? Well, it's pretty puffy. Okay, it's pretty shifty. Well, it's hot and cold. Okay, well, it's, you know, and, and we just start throwing out observations about what we're seeing, what we think might happen. And then you want to funnel that into, we basically, we divide the race course types down into two, two types. One on which we can expect some consistent feature and one type of race, a second kind of race course that we expect variability and change. And so you just want to be able to take all your observations and filter them into some meaningful conclusions that can then inform your decision making process. Um, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about making a ton of decisions throughout the day, um, knowing that you can throw some things out the window really helps clarify it and helps streamline this process. So we break it down either into one type of race course that's either you can expect consistency. For example, if there's a geographic feature like Steph showed you that left-hand shore in Palma. Okay, we know this bridge direction, left-hand shore, that's a geographical feature that's going to be relatively reliable. Um, maybe sometimes there will be more pressure on one side or the other. Uh, some sea, sometimes the sea state will be different. Maybe you're sailing and, and half of the race course is more in a harbor and half is more in exposed open water and the waves are going to be really different from one side to another. That's going to be pretty consistent throughout the day. Um, and maybe the shifts are persistent. Maybe it's an actual rotation in the wind. Uh, that kind of a trend, you can generally get a good um, indication from the forecast. You know, if the forecast is high confidence that the wind is going to go 90 degrees left between the hours of 11 and 2, okay, that's something that you can probably to some degree rely on um, and, and might be a consistent factor in racing, right? Um, <clears throat> then the other type of race course, when you can expect variability, I think would be more, more often the not the um, close to shore in the lake sailing with the random puff patterns, right? Are the puffs coming in random ways? Is it an oscillating breeze? Just a reminder, a persistent shift would be a shift that starts to go left and then continues to go further left and further left and further left, and further left throughout the day. An oscillating breeze is one that would go back and forth and back and forth. Now, there are two types of oscillating breezes. Sometimes it goes back and forth in a predictable pattern. And you can actually, I mean, some places you can set a clock to the oscillations. Um, and some people like to do that. Some very diligent homework doers, Steph, likes to do that. <laughs> um, and then in other places, you, it just, it's, there's no rhyme or reason, you know, and then you just have to say that, hey, these are totally random. We don't know what's going to come. So are the oscillations uh, in, a, in a pattern? Are there trends to it? Or are they totally random? And then if they're random, then then that's the type of pattern there, random pattern, right? Okay, so if there's a lot of unknowns on the race course, then that's also uh, expecting a variability. So we've got these two kinds. Are we expecting something predictable and consistent and maybe reliable? Or are we expecting change? And is the only constant today going to be change? All right, so one powerful tool that we have to help us um, assess the day, usually after, we're, after a day of racing, but sometimes between races we're able to access this, um, is the GPS tracking from SAP Analytics. Um, we'll go through just a few scenarios here that show um, course base versus um, you know, when you sail the course or when you sail the wind. Um, here we have an example from when we were racing in Japan last summer at the test event. Um, we had, we're, as you can see on the right, there's a, a Google Maps image of the, um, of the shoreline in Japan and we so we had shoreline on the left and then open water on the right and as you can see from the tracks on the left those um, the boats that went to the left ley line continuously got lifted to the mark um, and those those were the winning tracks from that day um, as we go into the next slide um, here's an example of of a persistent left shift that we had that made for a really long port tack um, you can see boats spent more time on port tack than they did on starboard tack. Um, this was a consistent trend that we saw throughout the day, um, but it made getting a really good lane on port tack um, a huge priority for the day. I think it was also in the forecast that day, right, Steph? Yeah. And, and so it was nice to have that forecast that came in with anything above confident or above average confidence level that said, look out for a left trend. 
you know, and then it's really great to start seeing that happen throughout the day and it gives you a little more confidence to send it left. Yeah. And if we'd shown you the 10 tracks of the different legs, you would see more and more left, left, left that day. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, and this is an example. So if you can see the, the green boat went to the right, the purple boat sailed up the middle, the red and orange boats sailed up the left. And uh, did I say that right? Orange also went up the middle, then the top left. Anyhow, point of this diagram is that the four boats at the top all came from different sides, right? And um, they tacked some two times, some one, two, three, they're gonna tack four times. Um, this is what we would call an open race course, when you can go left, right, or middle and be in the top four. That's an indication that, hey, this is an open race course. And that's a data point that, no, we don't get these winning tracks diagrams on the race course in real time, unfortunately. That would be pretty cool if we did, but we don't. Um, and so that, it's a conversation that Steph and I have on board. Sometimes when it's not really clear that one side won over the other, we'll ask each other, uh, what paid? Who came from where? What paid last? And if it's hard to keep track of, then we'll ask our coach between races. But that's just another example of um, a piece of information that, that you can gather and then learn more about as the course of the day goes on. You know, did we think we thought left was going to pay? Did the left pay? Where did the leaders come from? So, so that's just an example of an open race course. All right, so something I'm really excited to share with you guys tonight is um, a really cool chart that we worked with Dave Ullman um, to develop, and um, we call it day typing, and um, basically breaks the race course down into two race courses, like we talked about, the open race course, um, and then somewhere to race to. Um, you can see we have, in an open race course, we have two different situations, um, a stable wind and an unstable wind, and then under um, somewhere to race to, we have four different um, features. And most of the time we're racing in an open race course. Um, and for you guys in lake sailing, you're, you're probably most of the time sailing an open race course with unstable and puffy and shifty conditions. Um, but it's a, it's a cool way for us to just kind of have these, these defaults and just um, almost something to lean on to help you help us really make confident game plans. Um, actually, for a while, I had this chart um, laminated and carried it with me in my life jacket and just just something cool to refer back to. And I, it's, again, it's pretty simple, but that's how we, how we like to run things. Yeah, and I'd also like to mention that with a tool like this, it's okay for the terminology you use to evolve over time. And, and we'll talk about that later too with some of our um, daily reminders. But um, I don't know, I wouldn't necessarily, suggest you adopt exactly this chart but um making something as simple as this it, it is really helpful and also just the act of making charts like this and deciding on terminology forces you and your teammate to to talk about how you're thinking about these things and then make sure you're conceptualizing it in the same way and i think so just the you know also the process of putting something like this together that works specifically for your team can be really helpful as well so most of all um of the day typing, the, the chart that we were just looking at helps us remember what's going to be important in terms of our sailing style for that day. So there are two big kinds of race courses, one in which there's somewhere to race to, like we can expect a persistent shift or there's a geographical feature, but something's going to be consistent throughout this race, or it's an open race course and we're expecting oscillating breeze and random shifts, etc. So on the, when there's somewhere to race to, Oh, a good reminder would be that we're trying to minimize maneuvers so that we can get to a side. We're trying to get leverage. We want to get to the edge of a course, for example. Um, and so we might have to compromise on a lane, you know, if it's more important to really dig into that side as opposed to, um, you know, peeling off the hip of a pack. Uh, it's, and then you might have to be willing to compromise in order to get to that feature. Or it's also a nice reminder that, okay, say you do start and you don't have the best start in the world and you, you get pinched off the hip of a pack and they're all going left and you want to go left. Okay, if we have said we have to go left, we have to go left, then it's going to be a good reminder that that's going to be a clearing tack. We're going to tack and then we're looking to go back because we wanted to get to the left um, and, or vice versa going to the right. So your sailing style, you know, the number of maneuvers, what your objectives are in specific lanes and how much you're willing to compromise, that's all kind of your style for the day should be influenced by the type of race course you think you're sailing on. Um, and on the other hand, an open race course, um, if the shifts are unstable, like when we were talking about the persistent, I mean, sorry, the oscillating shift, if it's, 
if it's um, unstable and it's frequently changing, sorry, I'm at the bottom bullet point, and it's frequently changing in a high tempo, you're going to be tacking more often. You're going to have to do with the, you know, sail with your gut, like Steph was talking about earlier, feel the ships as they happen and roll with it immediately. That's a pretty decisive way of sailing. You know, in those moments when you get, you tack and get an auto header and you ha or an auto tack and you have to tack immediately, you don't have time to talk it through with your crew. You don't have time to say, oh, what, what's our, are the race scores we're trying to get to? No, it's like boom, boom, boom. You just got to go with it, right? Um, so that's sort of rolling with the punches, going with your gut. That's a high tempo, frequent changes. That would be pretty characteristic of an unstable race course on an open, or an unstable day in an open race course. Um, if, it, if there's any stability, if there's any pattern in the oscillations of the wind, then you have to remind yourself, we're trying to sail in phase right now, right? And just pointing at the mark is what matters. Um, and so you might end up sailing up the middle of the race course, like that one diagram we showed you of people just staying in phase, but by being in phase, they end up on different parts of the race course, but they still sail shorter distance than everyone at the same time they were all at the top. So um, yeah, these are just some reminders for how identifying the type of race course influences your style of racing for that day. Yeah, and, and with each different type of race course comes a different type of mentality. Um, you know, no matter what the day, the type of day is, it's important to be confident in your game plan and, and really own it. If you become wishy-washy about it, it's, it's easy to get caught doing things on the course that you don't want to be doing. So you have to really own your, own your game plan, constantly assess it, and then keep owning it if you keep changing it. Um, so that was something that Julia, our coach, really drilled into us and part of the reason this whole chart and day typing came about. Um, so with somewhere to race to, a big, you know, important part of that mentality is, is being patient, um, having awareness of where you are on the course, um, like Maggie was talking about, and then and sticking to your game plan. Um, if, you, if you have to go left, you have to figure out a way to make it happen. Um, whereas on an open race course with oscillating or random shifts, um, it's more of like the conversation we would have on board is, okay, let's make a late game plan, you know, two minutes or three minutes to go. We need to to start heading to our spot to start, but it's not a, you know, making a game plan at five minutes or 10 minutes to start. Um, so we're really delaying our, our game plan to looking for the first puff or shift. Um, and then ha keeping your head on a swivel and having a short term um, memory. I call ran, I call an open race course with random shifts, meerkat racing, where you have to be like popped up, propped up and looking around a lot like a meerkat and and making sure you're assessing um, everything that's going on around you. And to those of you guys that sail double-handed boats, um, mentality can also apply to your the way you communicate. You know, so on those meerkat days when stuff should be looking around the boat constantly, you know, I'll have to remind her get her head to get out your head out of the boat, or where's the next puff? What's the next phase? Where's the next pressure coming from? Um, and that's more a lot more important on the days that stuff is literally trying to connect the puffs and sail up the race course like that. I've, I'm on top of speed that day. Speed is not the priority in those moments. And so therefore I'm, you know, in my communication styles and as the crew, I can help guide, you know, Steph's focus out of the boat or into the boat. Um, on a day that it's a drag race to the left side, speed is going to be really critical. And that kind of gets into our next concept about how this all influences the type of homework you do. Yeah. So for being someone who didn't like a lot of homework in school, I do like a lot of homework on the race course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but as a team, we really believe in the power of prep. Um, again, everyone has their own style when it comes to racing, but we really like to get out there early. Maggie can attest to this, that I'm like first person on the launch ramp, just chomping at the bit to go. Um, but it gives me a relaxed feeling that we are able to get out there and tick off all of the homework that we want to do. So um, in our pre-sailing meeting for the day, um, we talk about what type of day it's going to be and um, based on the forecast that we have. And then we talk about our priorities for the warm up. So if we have an open race course with a stable day, we'll prioritize um, our compass numbers and our compass range um, and really hone in on our speed. So we'll make sure we have someone to line up with in the fleet um, and, and do some, some tuning runs where, you know, it's important that we make sure we spend equal amount of time on both tacks. Um, and then ultimately we'll do a split um, with that tuning partner, like a two or three minute split um, heading to opposite sides of the race course and then tacking back. Um, 
And again, we'll do the same thing downwind where we do a split and get our compass numbers. I'm gonna let Maggie talk a little bit more about compass numbers because she manages them. But on a stable race course day, that would be, those would be the type of homework that we're really honing in on. Yeah, and the compass numbers, um, some days, do you guys see all the compasses on the scouts stuff? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So some days we do sail just off the numbers. And then some days are, we'll disregard the compass numbers completely. And on a day that I know there's going to be a really uh, big emphasis on compass numbers and the shift range, for example, if it's an oscillating breeze day and there is a pattern or there's not, then compass numbers are going to be really important. If it's a if it's a steady sea breeze day and there's very little variation in the, you know, the course access of the, that the race committee sets or in our angle sailing up wind, that's not going to be such an important day. And um, the, the compass, the, the tiny little changes in the compass shouldn't be dictating decisions on those days. So on the days that it's, um, it's, it's critical, sometimes we'll write them down. Um, I've written them down on wet notes before. We've written them down on a boom. Whatever system works for you, it just helps simplify things. Um, a couple of rules for compass numbers. I'll give Steph a range and then tell her where we are in that range. And um, the fewer words I can say to communicate that, the better. And I need to keep it simple in my head. I usually round, you know, when describing a range, um, we'll round, round it to the nearest like five just to keep it really simple. Um, but then I'll say, okay, the range is zero to 10, but we are down three or something like that. Um, so you have to be precise about where you are in that range. Um, and how, sorry, I just saw this question pop up and I think it's really relevant. Todd Haynes just asked, how do we track the wind to see if it's oscillating or if it's random? Um, you can time the shifts with, uh, head, we do head to winds quite frequently before races. So Steph does like being the first person out of the race course. That's no joke. And sometimes we'll do like, if we know that it's going to be a random shifty day, we'll do a head to wind where Steph puts the bow directly into the wind. She watches our windex at the top of the mast. She tells me, Mark, when we're head to wind, and I take the compass number. Um, doing that over and over and over again tells you where the wind is coming from at that moment. And the more data you get, the more you can see, okay, it's either, it's been you know, 90, 90, 90, 95, 97, 100, or maybe it's been anywhere in a range of 30 degrees sometimes. Um, also our coaches and you know one really helpful tool is that our coach does have wind instrument data on, on her boat um, and so that will track the wind trends for us we usually use the wind instrument data between races just to confirm that our observations are accurate or inaccurate you know um, so I'll say this is the range we've been seeing on the compass this these are the trends we've been seeing and then we'll confirm whether that data is good or bad based on what we've been seeing on the wind instruments because we can't race with the wind instruments, we can't get any live readouts, so we just use it as a tool to make sure that our observations are in fact good. Um, Steph, did that kind of answer how we see if it's oscillating or random? Yeah, and I think just to add to that too is just um, understanding the geography too. Like if we're, um, if we're sailing kind of more of an, an open water venue, then we're probably going to see more oscillating shifts, whereas if we're tucked up next to land, we're gonna see some more of those um, kind of random random style shifts. Yeah, uh -huh. well, one other way that helps us figure it out too is if, if I, the, the amount of times you read out the compass numbers also kind of influences how, um, how stuff hears it. You know, if, if, I, if, I, if I say a compass number like 15 times in a row, <laughs> that's the only thing I'm talking about. I'm, I'm trying to you know, communicate that that's important. Um, and so if you, if you see no change in the compass for longer periods of time, that does give you an indication that the breeze has pretty, pretty, been pretty stable. Um, so as crews, if you're in charge of the compass, just, just remember that like the way you communicate the information also either puts emphasis on it or de-emphasizes it, if that's a word, <laughs> you know, can make it less important, minimizes the, its importance in the skipper's mind um, if they're hearing it a lot or not hearing it often. So back to the homework. Um, the compass numbers are important if we think it's a shifty, unstable day. But the other side of that is if it's a steady, sea breezy day and we're just sending it to one side and trying to tack once, speed is of utmost importance. So that's a day that we would, instead of getting compass numbers on both boards, we'd probably make sure Julia gets behind us, gets a good leech profile shot of our jib and make sure that that looks really good with the mainsail, that our set rig is in perfect settings, that um, our, you know, we know exactly where controls are coming on to before the start, our trapeze heights are good. All of those things on our boat really make a big difference in speed. 
if it's a really puffy shifty random day that the breeze is going through eight to 20 knots, which does happen sometimes, you're not going to be able to set up your boat perfectly for both those conditions. So you're going to be compromising in one or the other. So we're not going to waste time speed testing like Steph was talking about, or, you know, checking our controls and checking our leech and everything, because the amount of time you're spending in that exact condition that you're prepping in is going to be pretty small, right? So we would actually rather the most helpful data we could gather before that race would be the shift ranges, um, get some bearings around us. You know, sometimes stuff likes to look at shore and kind of get a feel for where we're pointing to. And that just gives you like a, you know, without having to rely on compass numbers, you get an orientation of the shift that day. But um, yeah, does that make sense stuff about how we, we would sometimes really prioritize understanding the shifts and then sometimes we're like, we're not going to, so don't even bother trying. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think that that transition us puts us in a good transition to talk about our unstable breeze where we have those super puffy um, shifty days. And like Maggie was just starting to touch on, it's, transitions are super important on those days. So making sure um, we're adjusting our weight smoothly, the controls are going on and off smoothly, we're um, just really grooving with our main sheet and, and tiller movements, um, and just both on the same power or same page for the amount of power in the boat. Um, also just simply practicing reading the wind and, and really count practicing counting down the pressure that's moving your way because it, the longer you can kind of watch and assess what's coming your way, the, the more dialed in you're going to be for racing. Um, yeah, so thinking about what the range and the wind speed is, what gears need to be changed for a really big puff or a really big lull, um, and make sure your settings can handle all those changes. Um, and then type of homework for a day when we have somewhere to race to. Um, we had one of these days in our world championship um, in February. This is a start from it. Um, you can see us, I think we're four, five boats up from the pin. Um, and this day we had three races where the left, the top left won every single beat. And you just, you had to go left or you were gonna die. And um, so we, we said, okay, you know, priority is getting off the starting line and having a really good lane so that we can send it to the left, tack and come ride that nice lift and pressure up to the winner mark. So um, our homework priorities between races were doing really good line research, um, really practicing our accelerations and making sure our boat speed was dialed in so that once we had our, our good lane to lure, we could just rip out to the left-hand side of the course. And can I make one point on that too? Um, if the starting, if the start is critical and, and sometimes, I don't know, it, starting is always important, right? But like Seth said, there's some days that you're trying to send it to the left and if you do two clearing tacks, you're gonna be behind five boats that didn't have to, right? Um, so that would be a day that we'd spend more time working on our starting line transit. And we'll talk more about that later. But we would even say to our coach, check our transit with us. I'll put my hand up when I'm on the line, you know. And, and that just tells you how much we've got a short amount of time between each race. And if we think the start is really important, then we'll allocate almost all of that time to doing that and practice accelerations. And we'll talk through starting reminders and everything, which Steph's about to tell you about right now. Yeah. So, again, just um, trying to keep things simple. I'm... I, I'm a big fan of visualization. Um, so one thing we've developed is a, a reminders document that we share between our team. Um, and it helps, helps us think about our race approach based on the conditions. Um, as you read through these, I'm sure you can imagine that some of them are really simple, but if, if I know in the morning it's gonna be a light air day and um, you know, I can read through these reminders and just visualize them um, for our approach to racing. Um, and yeah, I think it's just something fun to share, to develop with your teammate um, and share. And it's, you know, the reminders that we had four years ago are totally different than the reminders that we have now. Um, but you can see, um, you know, we have reminders that, about like how we actually physically sail the boat. And then we have a reminder about how we, you know, our attitude for, for that condition, um, which is something that's pretty fun to think about before racing. So here we have just some light air reminders and then some, sh some shifty offshore wind reminders. Um, then we get into some stable conditions um, and then windy, um, windy conditions. And I'd like to say, especially about the windy conditions or even the light ones when it's really hard to sail the boat, reminders like this can really help give you um, more confidence and it helps you feel 
sorry, feel like you're not going to make a decision or a mistake that you know how not to make. It helps you feel like, okay, I'm going to avoid that. Sorry, we have a landline. Um, and uh, the other thing is that um, Steph mentioned earlier, we really like to focus on the process. And this is definitely a way that when you're feeling nervous, when there's a lot going on, when you know, you're, you've got these jitters before the race, like having a chart that you look at to categorize the race type day or having a list of reminders to go through, it really helps you direct your mental attention to that process and feel like, okay, I'm focusing on my next step of executing what I know how to do. And, and this, these, I mean, these race reminders are also when you're just nervous and trying to kill time before the next race starts, it's a really great way to make the time go by. You feel like you're engaged, it helps you visualize. You're like, we're going to lock in. Oh yeah. I remember that one time I locked in and then you, you visualize it. And then, you know, and we'll talk a little bit more about racing mentality as the webinar series goes on. But I think this is a tool that really has been helping us, uh, stick to the process, stick to the basics, stick to the simple things and feel like you have the tools and it like reminds you that you've got the tools to do it, you know, so that's also why I really like it. Okay, and communicate, so did you want to add anything else about reminders? No, I think okay. you nailed it. Cool, um, so communication, I wanted to talk about this. I hope you guys have all seen the, the movie Sully, I really love that movie. Um, and, and one quote that I really dig from it is then when Sully says, uh, it's all about the timing, Larry. You can accomplish anything if you're never in a hurry. And I don't want to give away the movie because it's so wonderful, but if you haven't seen it, Captain Sully lands a boat on the Hudson River, and he is talking about, you know, when the FAA goes back and they do these simulations and they've got everyone in, you know, these amazing pilots in a simulation able to land it. He's like, well, they weren't in a hurry because they didn't have to process and understand the, the moment and what was happening. And that's the human part of it where, it, judgment comes in and it takes more time, right? And so the point of this whole thing is that it's a lot harder to make good decisions either when you're in a hurry or the pressure's on or you feel nervous or you're at the point and the time that you have to make it, right? Like that's the hardest time to make the decision. So anticipating decision points really helps you get the right information, um, have clear thoughts in your mind about what you're trying to do. And um, it kind of helps you execute the game plan that we're talking about. Um, if we don't talk about the fact that we're going to tack until we tack, you know, it's, it's not always obvious or it's not always in the right place. But if we talk about, okay, where are we getting on the race course? What are we doing? Are we getting the pressure we thought? Are we in the max pressure now? Um, then the decision comes a lot more naturally and it's a little bit more calculated. So one tool we like to use is these percentages. Um, and when you start the race, if it's a square course, like we talked about, if you would, in theory, if you only tack once, spend 50% of your time on starboard and 50% on support, on port. But as you get closer to the ley line, you're spending less and less time on the tack that you're on, right? So we, we would say 50-50, and that means we have as much time on starboard as we do on port, if we're on starboard at the moment. If I say 30-70, that means we've got 30% left on starboard, 70% left on port. And then when I, at like 10-90, that's when I'm warning stuff like, hey, decision point coming up, we're getting to the edge of the course, boats are probably going to start tacking, you need to start thinking about ley line. You know? And then that's when Steph starts thinking about okay, how do I gauge the ley line in the boat? Where am I sitting? What am I looking at? What are our angles? Is it windy? Is it light? You know, whatever. Um, but anticipating a decision point makes it easier to make a good decision when you have to. Um, is, the, is the kind of the whole point of that. And you have to use whatever system works for you. Some people like to time it out and they like to say 45 more seconds on this board, 20 more seconds on this board. I have no idea how anyone gauges that because I think that's so hard to do personally. Um, and that I don't like to do it. I like to do percentages because that's how I imagine things. I'm a much more visual spatial person. I can imagine our boat traveling for 50 more boat lengths or our boat traveling for five more boat lengths. And then I can imagine how far we've gone and then I make a percentage. And honestly, these are always guesses. They don't have to be perfect. They never are perfect, but at least you get the gist of we are kind of close to the ley line or, or we're really far from ley line. Um, and then as these percentages change, it also gives you an indication of is the course uh, getting skewed in the geometry of it one way or another. So um, that's one little tool we like to make. It's basically a countdown to decision points. And also um, it, it gives the crew opportunity to give good input, right? Because if, uh, if, if we don't talk about percentages at all, how terrible is that feeling when you go to call like ley line and everyone's already tacked and you're already there, right? So it's just, yeah, it's a helpful tool for that.
Yeah, and I, I think it just, it helps it for this whole conversation come full circle um, with the communication aspect of it and thinking back to the, the tactical intelligence and talking, you know, really having that constant narrative going of, okay, we're 50-50 we're here, I, I feel good with our lane, compass number, we're lifted, we're going fast, okay, we're happy. Okay, 1090, um, getting close to the ley line, starting to get headed, what's our escape route here? And just having that real constant narrative going on based on the course information you have, the wind information you have, and the um, opponent information that you have. So that kind of, that wraps up our chat. Um, we hope you guys enjoyed it and kind of want to open up the room to you all to ask any questions that you might have. Cool, cool. All right, so we'll start with uh, Rob Hudson. Um, our Annie Hager, uh, one of both, both of our good friends, um, she went to Rio and, and just sailed an amazing, amazing games down there. Um, what helpful hints has she shared about this opportunity and this honor? Um, yeah, I think Annie, Annie provides a lot of really great perspective on, on kind of overall campaign management and then also um, mindset and um, yeah, I think those are some really helpful tools that she's shared with us. Um, she, yeah, I think her and Brianna just ran an amazing campaign um, that really inspired our campaign. Um, Maggie, can you? Yeah, I learned a lot. They, they were really open and talking about teamwork and how critical having a solid team dynamic was. And um, they taught us a lot about how, how much you need to communicate about how you do communicate and um, they they had some great systems I remember about how they divided up responsibilities and the lists they would make and um, how they would I don't think they had conflict often but every team deals with conflict resolution and I think they had some really good uh, tips for dealing with that and it was bit my bottom line was you just you have to have all lines of communication open um, and you have to be able to talk about everything with your teammate everything that's bothering you everything that's not they had um, a team contract, which stuff we kind of made like a team agreement based, almost based on that, you know, where they, they laid out agreements um, just that they were, uh, how they were going to spend their time, how they were going to prioritize their campaign, you know, and how they were both going to be all in. And uh, I really like that concept that we took from them, which was, hey, let's just put this all down in writing, you know, let's make our mission statement. Let's make, let's talk about how we want to carry ourselves. And that all came from them. So I, I really appreciated a lot of what we learned about the team dynamic from them. I mean, we yeah, got so I much advice. It doesn't all come to mind right now. <laughs> you know, we call them all the time. <laughs> yeah. I think just kind of going off that they did a really good job of running a professional campaign. Um, and that's something we really look up to um, and strive to do ourselves. Um, next question is from Richard Beers. Hi, Richard. Um, I think I know what you mean about owning it, but what represents owning it and what is not owning it? Is it like being a victim or not? Um, I like it. <laughs> I, I would say it's just like, just like really rising up to the occasion and saying like, this is my game plan. It's the best game plan out there. And, and you just, you do everything you can to execute it a hundred percent and really believe in it. Um, as soon as I start saying to myself like, Oh, I, I think there's more pressure on the left. Mm, I'm not sure. Maybe there's more pressure on the right. Then I find us in the middle of the starting line, sailing up the middle of the race course with no leverage on anyone. So we, we haven't owned a game plan one way or another. Those are Maggie's favorite days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you get one more tack, get to a side. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's, yeah, owning it is just really like rising up and saying like, this is my game plan. This is the best I've got. I'm going to execute it as, as good as I can. Yeah. And yeah, there's a level of accountability too, right? Like owning your decisions and why did we make that decision? We like just it would be the opposite of owning it would be like sailing blindly, you know, and um, not understanding why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and I think that it's also like, I, I'll take it when, when, yeah, when I get the sense that our confidence level might be a little bit low, like I'll remind Steph that like, hey, I'll take whatever decision you make because you're making a judgment call. You know, and when you do make a judgment call, you got to own it. And, they, and as your teammate, it's like, I'll take your mistakes all day long. No problem. You know, like, um, I trust you. You're trying your best. You're trying your hardest. And so um, I think that that's part of owning it, too, is like just making a decision because making a decision is better than not making a decision. And then we're both all in on that, you know, and, and, and we're fully supportive of each other. 
whether it's a mistake or not, it's, it's better to have made a decision. Cool. Cool. Um, looks like we have a few from Al Hager here. Um, so I think this is referring back to um, our reminders. There's one that's um, in light air. It said locked into lure, and he's asking what that means. Um, so our boat really likes to be sailed perfectly flat. Um, and then in, in super light air, like when Maggie is probably not even on the trapeze, um, we really just try to lock in the boat to a really nice angle of heel. Um, and I think the, yep, the photo I showed here is, is just like, just a little bit of lured heel. Um, it gives a really nice feeling on the helm um, and just, um, yeah, just how the boat likes to be sailed on the chine like that. Yeah, and I'd say that that's a reminder also because it feels weird to us. Like the majority of the time we're sailing sailboats, we want them flat. Unless you guys are on your scows in the inland lakes, right? You sail them all healed up and crazy. Okay, with skiffs, we sail them flat like most normal sailboats. And uh, I'm kidding. But um, at, then in this one condition, we want to sail with like three or four degrees of lured heel. And when you try so hard all day to keep the boat flat and then it gets a little bit lighter and now you need to sail with a little bit lower heel, it doesn't feel right. Like you're actually closer to the water or steps farther away from the water and I'm closer when I'm up forward. So you're like, your whole orientation is off a little bit. That's why it's a reminder because it's a change and it feels unnatural and so we have to like remind ourselves like, okay, in this condition, we're going for a little bit of lower heel, like lock it in. Locking it in means not you know, being unstable and we're really focusing on keeping the heel very stable on that chine like Seth talked about. Cool. And he just asked also um, to clarify what more pressure, squeeze, and press means. Um, and that's just as we get a little bit more wind and we want to get out of the lock to lured mode when Maggie can really squeeze on the main sheet and, and close down the leech a bit more and we can just um, press more, push more weight with our, um, on our trapeze. It's just going for a flatter boat there. The boat can, the boat can handle more main sheet tension um, and more weight from us. So really, it, it's like a really super fine crossover in our boat. Like when you go from this really light and locked to lured to when you're, you're flat and squeezing the main for all the power that it has. Yeah, and it's, it requires a coordination from both of us. So in windy conditions, when we're both just hiking as hard as we possibly can, and I've got to ease the main and depower the sail to keep us flat, you know, and that's what we're always doing. In contrast to that, in this condition, Steph literally has to like step out and press her weight against the sail as I'm trimming it. And if it doesn't happen at the same time, the boat like spins up and Steph has no helm and it's, it's a sort of a funny mistake. You're like, oh, I rounded us up again, you know? Um, so this moment and this specific condition that I, I don't know, what do you think? It's like six, seven knots Steph. It's like just yeah. this it's a really yeah. fine crossover. Yeah, and there's a lot to be gained if you can nail that, but it requires coordination from us. And, and again, hence the reminder. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a tricky skill. It's a departure from the norm because usually we're either trying to be flat or a little bit of lowered heel. We're not trying to just load the boat up, sail with maximum amount of leech pressure. So yeah, I don't mean to ramble about it, but the point is these are reminders because they are, they are weird feelings and they're, they're not the norm. Like I wouldn't put in a reminder that is like sail the boat upright, you know? Um, so it's, it's cool. To, yeah. Thanks for noticing these, these random things that made it on the list. Um, and you, we had another question from Al about, um, what are some other examples of countdown decision points? Um, I've got an answer to that. So in addition to ley lines, because those are ones that are kind of obvious, um, say, say Steph has communicated that we are either sailing defensively, you know, and so we're just trying to stay in front of a pack because maybe we really like where we are. Maybe we're winning the race or we're in the top five or something. And we want to finish where we are. So we're sailing in a defense, defensive mode, trying to sail in front of a pack. All right, we have a decision when that pack does something, right? So when they all start tacking away. And so if I see the one boat is tacked, or you can tell when people are looking around a lot, okay, they're thinking about tacking. Um, that's the time where I would kind of cue stuff. Okay, boats are starting to tack. Um, and that, that's letting her know that before everyone has tacked, and we've missed our opportunity to tack on them, to understand that like a decision point is coming up. Um, similarly, off a starting line, uh, when boats start, splitting you know when the fleet starts people start tacking off people's hips if they lost their lane or maybe they're tacking and ducking um i'll tell i'll tell stuff like okay uh two-thirds of the fleet's going one way we're with one third over here you know and that starts the conversation about okay are we going to the side we want to go to and if not then that starts counting her down into like uh 
Um, how can we attack them being in a controlling position going out to the right? Um, does that make sense, Steph? It's like what either ley lines or what the other boats are doing, those are generally our decision times that we count down to, but you're just kind of giving them a heads up before it's already happened, you know, so we don't miss the opportunity to tack on a pack. Like Steph, if Steph's really focused on speed, and I see that every single boat's tacked out of the left, all of a sudden we're the furthest left boat. And I say, well, everyone's tacked. You know, that's not really helpful. You're like, okay, well, now we got to go. But if, if, you've known, if you know that boats are starting to, or that the majority has, then, then that kind of helps, yeah. Cool. And then the last one, um, use the undercut upwind to avoid ley lines early. That was also a reminder, I think, in our, yeah, in our stable wind conditions. Um, We'll actually get into this a lot more in a couple of weeks when we talk about um, upwind tactics. Um, but it's a really strong move where you, if you're not winning the race, you're more in like the 10 to 15, um, like 10 to 15th in the race. Um, you can actually, you, you tack underneath the ley line um, on starboard, for example, you can tack underneath the starboard ley line, 10, 15 boat lengths underneath it. Um, and then you have, oftentimes there's a pretty clear lane there. So. Um, that's something we'll get into in a couple more weeks, but it's, um, it's a really cool trick that we've been using in our racing. Yeah. You'll just have to tune back in to find out <laughs> what's well, user stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Good> <laughs> <fire>. <laughs> um, real quick, Bridget, Bridget, um, wanted us to talk about boat speed a little bit more and favor tack, um, in traffic. And then also wanted us to talk about how current affects our decisions as well. Um, Maggie, do you want to touch base on some more of the, the boat speed type stuff? Um, I'm guessing that's like managing boat speed versus all the other factors that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah well, I mean, I think the type of day it is dictates how much sort of mental energy we put into um, talking about this, our boat speed, you know, and, well, and mental and verbal energy into talking about it. So if it's a day that it's a drag race to one side or the other, um, like I said earlier, well, the homework will be really focused on how is our setup? What, what's our rig tune? What if I do a couple more turns? Does it feel better? Does it feel worse? We'll do speed testing with people. Um, but if it's really not a boat speed day and the conditions are changing rapidly and the wind is going up and down, then it's, it's not such a big focus. And actually I would set the boat up like at a pretty like versatile setting. So some settings we know we have a really big range with this rig setting. Um, and I'm talking about like the tension of our shrouds and we can talk more about this later too in the specific rigging setup stuff, but um, certain settings are just easier to sail the boat. You've got a wider groove. And so on a, on a day that's going to be really transitional, we'll set the boat up to have a wider groove and just to be generally easier to sail. And then you shoot to sail it, like sail it well 80% of the time because you know, you're not going to be able to sail it perfectly a hundred percent. Yeah. And I'm, I think, Oh, I was just going to oh. say like, I think a lot of like our boat speed comes from, from training. We, we put a lot of emphasis on, on finding our rig settings and finding, um, yeah, finding rig settings and uh, that work for us in different conditions and really, and logging them as well. Um, that's something that we really cherish a lot is rigging, as logging all of our rig settings. We have a, a little book that we travel around with that um, keeps, keeps all of our, past settings for different conditions and then we can refer back to them pretty quickly. Um, oh, the last time we were on an eight to 12 knot day on Biscayne Bay, we were at this setting and we were, we were ripping or we didn't like this setting at all on this mass. So let's not touch that again <laughs> in, in, that, in that scenario. So um, I hope that helps. Um, you know, a lot goes into boat speed that we can talk about later. You know, there's equipment, yeah. there's crew weight, there's settings, but I'd say the of all those things, the, the, the biggest technique that influences our boat speed is our main sheet and driving relationship, that relationship of how we trim the sails and how we drive the boat. And um, we can get into that more later because we've also made that very simple. You know, we, we, we have a couple code words, you know, it's, a, it, it's on you or it's on me. And uh, yeah, it's a similar process to kind of hone in on your boat speed as well. Cool. Well, Thank you, ladies. I just wanted to take the opportunity to say this was absolutely fantastic. Given the past five weeks of craziness and wondering if we will ever sail again, this webinar has been an absolute highlight to get us excited. I'd like to have a round of applause from everyone who is still out there for the sponsors, the organizers, the presenters, and the participants. And we can do that by raising your hand.
Well, th thank you to absolutely everyone. And for more information and the recorded series, go to www.salesing.com. Watch out for a follow-up email in your inbox. Stay tuned for scout lines and learn how to register for the next webinar at ILY.org. And the next webinar will be Maggie and Steph next Wednesday, April 29th, 6 o'clock central. So tell your friends, your crews, other sailors at your lake, and let's all get ready to get on the water and sail. Thank you very much, very much. Thank See you, you next everyone. Week. Thank you all. See you next week. All right. Bye-bye.